Hello there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. Savvy Painter is the podcast for painters who know that mastering your craft is a lifelong venture. They understand that the hardest part is showing up every day, whether they're inspired or not, and that we're all in this together. For the past three years, the Savvy Painter podcast has been sharing tips and techniques that you can use every day in your studio. And when you join the Savvy Painter email list now, you get a collection of inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe to sign up for weekly emails and get your free PDF essential tips for artists. Each week, I interview established artists like Anne Gale, Scott Connery, Rebecca Crowell, and many other artists who are willing to open their studio doors, share their painting processes, and talk candidly about what it takes to consistently grow your skills. We get into the nitty gritty of their daily studio practice, what tricks they play on themselves to avoid getting caught up in perfectionism, how to use flashcards as reminders to stay on track during long painting sessions, and other cool tactics to quiet the inner critic and continue moving towards excellence. The Savvy Painter podcast is filled with artists who generously share their stories, and by sharing their stories, they show the rest of us that we are not alone. So join us with the Savvy Painter email list and get even more connected with weekly emails. Sign up now and you get essential tips for artists, the inspiring quotes and practical advice collected from years of Savvy Painter interviews. Go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. It's that easy. Jose Trujillo is my guest today. Jose is an impressionist artist living in Tucson, Arizona. And in this episode, Jose shares how at just 14 years old, he started approaching galleries, trying to get his work out in front of collectors. Since then, he's been obsessive about learning how to market and sell his paintings. Jose really enjoys talking about what he's learned. So I took advantage of that and grilled him about what steps he took, and how exactly he built his business. He talks about how his approach has evolved, the mistakes that he's made, what he's learned from them, and how he's grown since 14-year-old Jose first hit the streets with a batch of paintings under his arms. So without further ado, here is Jose Trujillo. Jose, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation. Can you talk about your early days as an artist? When did you decide that you wanted to do this as your vocation? It was one of those cliche things. I think I started started when I was really young. Someone introduced me, a friend, one of my mother's friends introduced me to watercolors and acrylics and crayons and stuff like that. But beyond crayons, I mean, more like, like color pencils and things like that. And I had felt that that was something that wasn't going to go away. The moment I started drawing, and and I was I was really young. I mean, again, one of those cliche stories when I started when I was about five years old or something like that. And I could feel that very intense that I felt like an artist. I didn't know what an artist was or how to put that together, but it felt strong. So it was about then, and then later on when I when I went to high school and started playing around with colors and other stuff, then that's when it became more pronounced. Mm. Was it always something that you just instinctively knew that you were going to take this serious and be a professional artist and do what you needed to do to make a living off of it? You know, I think I think I left that part out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that didn't come until later. In the beginning, it was this joy. It was this more of a, I'm saying Spanish, uh, caprichos. I'm sorry. You can, <laughs> you can edit that out if you'd like. <laughs> Just like kind of capriciousness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be this avant-garde artist and I'm going to start doing all this. You know, I I wanted to be an avant-garde. You know, I wanted to be in the forefront and, and doing things that no one else was doing. And I think that's part of a bit of growing up and recognizing that potential when we're young. We automatically recognize, and sometimes we blow it out of proportion because our skills are not are not in par with our potential. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that 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 was something that I wanted to do. I didn't know anything about monetization. I've always been interested in marketing and that sort of deal, but I had no idea what it was going to take. So that didn't happen till later on, till in my mid twenties was when I was really starting to think about it more serious. And what did you do when you realized like, okay, I need to market this and I need to present my work to people? 
Can you talk about that? How were you feeling about that? Was it exciting? Was it scary? What was going on in your head? Absolutely. Look, I've marketed my work since I was about 14, 15 years old. I started doing it thinking that I was doing a lot, but it was about where I was. So it was very mediocre, the efforts I was doing. Now, this might sound like, you know, to <laughs> maybe to other artists, well, no, I mean, you're doing what you're doing. But when you don't know how much something needs to happen, you tend to think that, you know, you're running faster and, 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 and you know, stronger and faster than everyone else. But that's because everyone else is not running around you. So what was 14-year-old Jose doing to market the work? I was visiting galleries. What I would do is that I would ask my dad or a friend to put paintings in their car and let's go around in local mom and pop galleries. And I was, and I think that out of happiness or I don't know, out of curiosity, they were like, well, let's, let's give this kid a, a chance. And I was 16 years old when I got my first one man show. And I had already put together about 200 pieces. So I was always very prolific since I started. It was in my, 20s when I started realizing how much more effort it took. And then my wife, who I'm married to, of course, right now, <laughs> her name's Lizette, she, she started helping me, right? We're going out and she would stay long nights helping me put together artist packages because that's what we used to think that worked. You know, back, I'm not much older, but but I still remember when we, we had to do the, the whole artist package mm-hmm. deal, you know, putting slides and, and the whole artist bio and all of that. And I was already sending by the hundreds to galleries everywhere. But uh, again, it was one of those things that I didn't realize how much effort it actually took, how much audience I needed to reach. How were you choosing those hundreds of galleries that you were sending out to? It was shooting from the hip. Everything I've done since since I was a kid, I always knew that I was that something good was going to happen out of massive effort. And if something good didn't happen, I was going to learn something. So it, there wasn't really much, you know, choosing. It was it was just looking, oh, that's a gallery. Awesome. Were you looking at what kind of work they they produce or what were you, were you just like, there's a gallery, here's the address, I'm sending my work out? Yeah, not at all. I wasn't even looking whether they had they had. A- oh, Jose, you're the worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't looking at it. Well, 14 year old Jose, I'm sorry. I'm, I shouldn't say you are. <laughs> Something really interesting happened that what I found out really quick was, well, one, I didn't know how to prospect, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And two, it was okay because what happened was that people, people, I learned how how to communicate very quick. And I would, I would ask the gallery owner, right, very quick. After a few burns, I started asking, well, if it's not you, who is it? And I think that they just they saw the willingness or they saw that I was young. I don't know. They thought it was probably interesting that I was asking these questions. And they were like, well, here, let me get a friend mm-hmm. or let me talk to someone. I give you a little space in their gallery. And, you know, but it was this sort of audacious, you know, little kid trying to get in the, in the galleries. And I soon realized... If I tweaked, you know, and I started really looking into what type of work they carry, where are they, where they actually moving product or not, and all those things, sooner or later, I was bound to learn that. But one thing that I knew that I was right at from the beginning was that I had to do, I had to do volumes. You know, I had to, I had to go visit as many people as possible. Mm-hmm. And that stuck. You know, that was, that was, that was one of the first things that I learned. And I see that being a, one of the things that has helped me throughout my career. So the next question that artists always have is, how are you pricing your work? So for those early galleries, what were you pricing your work at? And how did you learn to manage that piece of the business? I was doing every mistake possible that you can do. You know, one of the things that I realized was that these galleries had interns, right? Mm -hmm. And then the interns had far less experience, of course, than the, than the owners. The owners would tell me, you know, you're starting out. Let's, let's price this at, you know, $200, $300. Let's, let's, let's start there because you're young and you can produce and, and, you know, let's get some product. Let's move some product. And that sounded actually very smart. But in my mind, I was thinking what every, just about every other artist that I knew in my circles, you got to price them high, you got to start really high. And, you know, I don't think that price really is that, whether it's high or low, whatever it is, it's really the determining factor in an artist. But 
when I was doing that, <laughs> I started listening to everyone around me who was really not an authority. I should have been listening or maybe paying more attention to the owners because the owners were actually the ones moving the product, you know. <laughs> so I was doing every mistake. I was, I was, I was getting one of my, you know, little paintings and, and saying, well, this one took me three months to make. So this one's going to cost, I don't know, uh, $15,000. And then this one took me, you know, three hours to make. This one will cost, you know, a hundred dollars, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> anything, that kind of deal. So you would imagine. <laughs> Is there a specific story you can tell me about a conversation you had with one of those owners about how to price your work? Yeah, they were very pragmatic. I think because they were, I had a time here when, when actually my one man show, the owner, I'm not going to say any names, but the, the owner is uh, from Italy. And he had already done different small businesses. So he had some experience under his belt. And when he opened the gallery, he told me, look, Jose, I know that you want to paint this stuff. I don't want to interfere with your artistic eye or anything like that. But we're in the Southwest here. We're in, we're in, in, in Tucson, Arizona. And he would, he would ask me, is it okay? Would, be, would it be okay that you paint some Arizona landscapes? Because we have a lot of snowbirds that come and you know, come here and then they, they like your work, but they don't really, they can't identify with your work. Now, at the time, I was trying to be Dali. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> So he started, you know, kind of nudging me in, into understanding also the market without without selling out, but understanding the market and started talking to me about pricing and things like that, such as, uh, you know, if you have a small piece of artwork that you create, don't try to, especially when you're starting out, don't try to take everything. He would tell me, it, it was funny, he used to tell me, you know, it's like blood, you know, you have to leave a little bit out. You have to you have to bleed a little bit for people to come in and start getting to start trusting you. You know, maybe they won't they won't buy your three thousand dollar piece to start out with, but but it would be okay if they bought a fifty dollar little piece or a twenty five dollar print or you know let's let's have them start there mm-hmm. for them to to have a. I mean, he he really mentored me from the beginning. I didn't have much uh, interactions after that because he was he was a bit you know sour after <laughs> me not wanting to bring the prices down or accept commissions that didn't have to do with my style. You know, as an artist we were dead set on certain styles we're like um one of the questions we ask each other nowadays is like what do you paint oil acrylic what is it like we're so singular you know it's this it's this very and if someone does two three different things it takes photographs does acrylic does uh, some oil paint some portraits and this and that and it's the same artist it's almost we even think it's a bit ridiculous you know we, t- we say no you you don't have a you don't have a voice and you know that kind of thing so so i was very interested in in what most of my peers were interested in, which was having a singular style, being known for the for the artist who paints, you know, blue skies or whatever with some type of signature. And do you still adhere to that now? Do you still consider your, yourself to have a signature work? So for people who are not familiar with you, people who are listening right now who've never seen your work, who is Jose Trujillo? I don't hold that anymore. And it was a growing experience for me. It was a very painful and growing experience. When I paint, I just paint. I look at myself as as an actor. I think that would be a better example. No, an actor doesn't say I only do comedy or I only do you know drama. It's he, he or she's an actor. And as an artist, I learned that that was going to bring in more more experience to my table and also a more opportunity because as I'm trying to lift off a portrait little gig happening. I wanted to be a portrait artist. And someone would tell me, can you paint me, you know, can you paint my ranch, a landscape or something? I'd be like, no, 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 no. I'm a portrait artist. You know, I can't do that. Big mistake, big mistake when I was starting out. So Jose Trujillo is just an artist who who just paints, you know, and and, and I think that the whole signature thing comes through experience. It's not going to come forced. So (laughs) I hope I made any sense there, Andres. Yeah, you did. It's really interesting because so many artists are who listen to this program are going through a lot of that right now where they're trying to figure out who they are, what their voice is. And I, I do think that there is value in focusing on a specific thing for a while. So, you know, like you have a lot of, you know, to stick with the actor analogy, actors typically will start in a specific genre 
and master that and then move on to something else. Absolutely. I agree. I, I agree 100%. You know what? You don't want to be all over the place for the sake of it. I heard this person once say, it's a marathon, but you got you to gotta run in sprints. You got to conquer certain miles. And that, to me, applies to, to art style. I think that it's a, it's a huge stress that artists have focusing over and over on, on voice, on style. I personally didn't feel like I understood what I was about until I painted about 10,000 pieces. Mm-hmm. I didn't understood what I was about, what my, my thing was. It came so natural after so much, so much work. One of the things that we forget as artists is, is the word work. It's artwork. It's not just art. And that really has helped me define putting in the time and challenging myself has really helped me define define me. Not not maybe to other people. Maybe other people may, might see my work and you know say, well, that's derivative. You're not really, you know, you're not doing anything new. It's not necessarily about doing anything new, it's about it's about growing as a personal, you know, as a as, as a person, as an artist. And it's stretching those paradigms. Cause I think we all come with them, you know, these certain paradigms. And the very first thing that happens, I believe. And here I go ranting on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I will cut you off if I need to. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Let me know. The very first thing that, that happens, I think those those ideas of being all over the place, that I believe happens when artists are starting out or are not committed. You may be painting for three, four months. And so you have to be all over the place because you're touching buttons. You're trying, to, you're trying to see where the vein is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And another thing that could be happening also is that you could be painting for, you know, and I have people contact me here and there, people that are older, they say, you know, I've been painting for 40 years, but never really grown because I do it only in segments in my life, or I only show up to the studio once a month or when I feel like it. Mm -hmm. And so that also keeps you in the, in not focus, it keeps you all over the place. Yeah, yeah, you have to, you have to commit and do the deep work and be really, kind of obsessive about what you're doing for an extended period of time. It's kind of like if somebody was learning to play a string instrument and they're picking up the banjo, they're picking up the guitar, they're learning this, they're learning that, but they never invest a significant amount of time being excellent at one thing. And once you learn that one thing, you can apply it all over the place. Once you learn the chords, once you learn the artistic notes, then you can apply those to anything you do, but you have to get obsessive and you have to do it over an extended period of time. And an extended period of time is years and decades. It's not when I feel like it on the weekend. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of the things that I I noticed looking back, I spent a lot of time with just pencil, charcoal, and then uh, ink. And then I spent a lot of time with acrylic and then oil. And I mean, a lot of time, I mean, years. Yeah, you're exactly right. I, I wasn't testing, you know, playing when I was starting out, yes, but as soon as I got a hang of what it was to to start creating artwork, I would obsess for months or a couple of years in a new medium. Mm-hmm. I just obsessed on it and use it, add it to my arsenal. I like the Picasso approach, you know, not necessarily I don't mean this by, by saying I like to paint like Picasso. No. His approach was very free flow. It was like, oh, this new technology, here, let me try that. He, always reinventing, always learning. You know, I think that's to me that's the mark of of. Not, not, I'm not going to say the true artist because that. Well, I mean, whatever that means, right? Right. But that's the mark of someone who's hungry, and I consider myself hungry in that sense. How has I mean, you've come into this at a time when there's been massive change in the art world and how people share and market their their work what has been the most impactful for you in terms of speaking of technology in terms of recent advances and changes in how art is presented and marketed i think that definitely i mean what's happening right now online mobile you know i think that that's that's a game changer and we haven't even scratched the surface we haven't seen what's to come Another thing is that's not technology, it's using both. One of the things that I feel blessed with was that I started out by knocking doors. Mm -hmm. I started out doing the whole meet and greet person, you know, toe-to-toe selling. (laughs) Which is terrifying for some people. Yeah. So elaborate on that. Why do you say that you're blessed by having gone through that experience? Because at the end of the day, no matter how much technology there is, if you don't learn certain things, if you don't learn how to market, if you don't learn how to sell, if you don't, if you actually don't learn how to ask for an exchange, 
of value. You know, give me some money for this painting because this painting is more valuable than what you're giving me. If at the end of the day you don't know how to do that, it, it becomes very difficult to be behind the computer and say, you know what, there's all this technology, but I still have no sales. I mean, regardless of the technology, the sales aren't there. And as artists, we scratch our heads. We join groups of artists. We, we try to talk to other artists and we're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And it, no matter how much technology there is, it will always come down to effort and skill. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about artistic skill. I'm talking about people skill. It will always come down to that. Yeah. And this is in no way I'm, I'm trying to say that if you don't know how to, you know, if you don't paint and you know how to sell, you're going to win. But then maybe, you know. The thing is, it's, it's a skill and skills can be learned. And just like with your your painting skills, there are interpersonal skills and learning to deal with rejection, learning to deal with the possibility of rejection by even submitting your work somewhere. Those are all real things. And just like with painting, the only way you can learn how to paint is to stand in front of a canvas and put your paintbrush on the canvas and mix the colors and paint. That's the only way to learn how to paint. And the only way to learn how to sell your work is to start selling your work and to get out there. And the only way to get into a gallery is to start approaching galleries. Absolutely. And I agree a thousand percent on that. There's just no way around it. I have artist friends who ask me, for example, I sell on eBay, right? I sell online. I sell on, on my Facebook page. I, I sell in every opportunity that I can. And I have artist friends who, who, who ask me, like, how do you do it? Or how, you know, what is the approach? And my answer is it's always the same. Before I went online, and granted, there's certain things, advantages, of course, of being online, of course. But before I went online, I understood that I had to see at least 100 people to, to get three people interested mm -hmm. before I went online. And this is something that artists, for the most part, detest because we think, again, many times we think very singular. We're like, I'm the artist, let someone else deal with the marketing and the sales aspect of that. But, you know, the, the, the more you're playing in the game, the more you realize that someone else is you. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, because unless you have enormous amounts of money to find a person who has the qualifications to do that and to go, you know, like that's the service that art galleries supply to artists. And that's why they charge the commissions that they do. So I think sometimes we want the best of both worlds. We want somebody who's going to work for us in that regard and not charge an enormous commission and, you know, and come knock on our door and find us and come in on a white horse and save us. And <laughs> that sounds really kind of insulting, I think, in some ways, but it's it's a very blunt way of, of putting it, whether we're honest about it or not. I think a, a lot of us wish that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> and and sort of like use that as an excuse to to not work because you know if you're truly talented and if you're truly a good artist then you know the work will sell itself and I don't know anybody whose work sells itself. Do you know anybody that way? No, I haven't met that person yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't know that if that I, I call artist agents is one of the things that we used to talk about when I, when I was younger amongst artist groups. We used to act bohemian, sit at the cafes and drink our little coffees and kind of like the whole 90s thing, right? <laughs> and we used to talk about where are these artist agents? You know, where are the art buyers? And, and, the, and another word, art collectors. And the more I've been playing the game, the more I realize these are all mythical creatures. You know, for all I know, an art collector is my next door neighbor who needs something over their sofa, as blunt as that sounds. And maybe they start there. And maybe the next next step is learning a little bit about the artist. And then maybe that's where the curiosity starts. And before you know it, they have some uh, disposable income and they become ardent collectors of your work. So this whole thing about looking for that art collector who's already collecting and who's, you know, a diehard collector and the art agent who's, you know, we, we picture these people like men in black who are, you know, cruising in yachts and, and we're artists. It's not sports. Like we're not playing football or basketball. We're not blessed like those guys. We have a different challenge. <laughs> and, and maybe this used to happen, you know, and I don't mean to be, I don't mean to offend anyone but, by this, but maybe this used to happen in the seventies. I don't know. I've, I've read that, you know, some, some artists were extremely 
blessed with, especially in the 80s where, you know, free free flow was was happening of, you know, income in the in the states. Maybe it happened then and maybe maybe people had fun with, I don't know, the artist agent. I certainly I just don't believe in that. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it did happen at some point to some people, but I think it's to go back to the actor analogy, I think it's about as probable as being the next big starlet being discovered drinking a milkshake at the local diner. It happened once. <laughs> that's the unicorn. <laughs> it's not the it, that's not the norm. The norm is something completely different, but I think also we've we have to take responsibility for part of it. And part of it is this sort of myth that we've been fed that your job is just to be in your studio and paint. And that sounds really wonderful, but I don't see that, you know, like if that's all you do, then how would anyone know you even exist? Yeah, I I opened three. So it's funny you mentioned that. I opened three studios when I was younger. I I don't know how I pulled the rent together to pay for that. (laughs) But I... I... (laughs) I opened three three studios throughout my career when I was starting with that notion. If I just stay here and paint, and I wasn't the only one. I mean, I wasn't the I wasn't a lonely a lonely bird. Most of my art friends, and I still see it today. They have their studios, and it's almost like this. Again, it's that capricho that I, that I mentioned. You know, this this thing that I'm going to do. And I won't bother about monetizing or I won't bother about, let's not even go to monetizing. I won't bother about going into someone else helping me out to spread the message of my vision or, you know, galleries or whatever, because it's, it's uncomfortable. So I'll just, I'll just stay here and paint. Nothing ever happened for me doing that. It was the worst time. I created a lot of art. I learned how to create art, but I could have done that and being proactive in finding someone to purchase my artwork at the same time. So I just kind of been thinking about all the questions that I've been asking you. We're sort of like kind of getting on this conversation of here's everything that we artists do wrong. So (laughs) let's, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) let's shift that a little bit. And so now that we've figured out, or we haven't figured this out, but now that we've sort of established some of the mistakes that we tend to make as artists, what are some of the things that work? Absolutely. I think that's uh, that's a great question. And what a great way to follow it up, because <laughs> first we have to figure out what we're doing wrong sometimes in order to get <laughs> to a better place. Right. Quantity. When I started learning about effort in quantity, I know it sounds abstract, but I'm, I'm going to go into it. For example, you have, I don't know, you have about 50 works that you've worked on, you know, let's for the sake of the number. What you need to do as an artist, I believe, is figure out one of the channels that exist, there's many channels. There's Instagram, there's galleries, whatever takes you, the straight line, whatever takes you faster to wherever you want to go. Maybe you don't want to monetize yet for whatever reason. You want to show your work. Instagram, everyone's on Instagram. You have to be able to know how to play the game and do more than what you're used to. I believe strongly on quantity. Here's another thing. You want to visit as many galleries as possible. One of the things that I used to do was you see, this is one of the things, this is, this is why I'm kind of dancing with it. When we start knowing things, we start cherry picking, and this is something that doesn't help. So, so we need to remove that and then start just doing things. No matter if it's the right thing or the wrong thing, it's still the right thing. It's, it's moving you forward. So one of the things that I believe works is just putting yourself out as much as possible. If you have 50 works and you have two weeks off at work or whatever, and you put away a couple of, I don't know, hundred dollars, a couple of thousand dollars, whatever, visit as many galleries as you can in your state. Mm -hmm. And it will come down to how many people you reach. When you say you have to know the game being played around you, I love this question. What is the game, Jose? What do you see the game as? The game is understanding the platform that you're in. You have to be able to understand the platform, I think. Whatever, whatever that is, wherever you're, you're, you're trying to do. For example, if I wanted to do a podcast, you know, I, I don't know anything about podcasts, but I would have to understand what time our listeners there and not get caught up in those mechanics, but understand the game. How is the game played? How do I get an audience? Where do I go? And how long does my podcast have to be? How, how often do I have to put out a podcast? Who do I talk to? How do I find collaboration? You have to understand. That's what I mean by the game. And if you're in a platform where you're selling, for example, on, on eBay or Etsy or, or Sachi Art or any of those platforms, you have to be able to understand what people go there 
What are the price points they're buying? How often are they showing up? What time are most people showing? What time are they buying? And you have to understand the audience and you have to understand, you know, you have to you have to understand about everything about it without getting caught up in analysis paralysis. And now this is a subtle game, I think. I think this is a, a delicate dance, I like to call it. Mm-hmm. You have to understand everything without paralyzing. So it's learning and moving at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the analysis paralysis is a is a big deal, even if artists aren't even aware of what that means. But when you start to fixate on one small cog in the wheel, and there's this thing called this kind of psychological event that happens when we focus on something. And what happens is whatever you're focused on becomes the most important thing. And so if you're just focused on this little tiny cog in the big wheel, then all of a sudden that little tiny cog becomes the most important thing kind of at the exclusion of everything else. So if you're researching Instagram, for example, and you somebody says like, oh, you need to find out what time people are on Instagram. And all of a sudden you're spending three weeks trying to figure that out. Exactly. You're in analysis paralysis. <laughs> it's it's yeah. important, but it's not three weeks important. Absolutely. That's the thing. It's it's removing those things. See, as as I'm growing in my career, small business as an artist, the more time goes by, the more I realize that it really has to do with removing certain blocks. We have all these blocks, all these parameters, all these all these things that you you can only operate in these places. And I don't know if it was put in by society itself or uh, misunderstanding of the market or whatever it was. Who knows? I don't know. But what I do know is that. That I'm not the only one. No. And I've noticed that, you know, and, and the more I, I realize is, look, you have to figure out what works for you. It, it can't be like everyone else, but it, at the same time, you can't, again, you can't fix it and trying to be the most unique artist because your time will, will go by. And I think that it's, again, one of those delicate dances that, yes, I want to learn. I want to learn Facebook. I want to learn eBay. I want to learn Etsy. I want to learn, you know, all these things. I want to learn Twitter. But at the same time, you have to keep moving, keep that that ball rolling. Mm, I love it. Interesting. So keeping in that line of, of what works and what doesn't, what have been some of the more, and again, I want to preface this, <laughs> the, <laughs> danger, the danger in asking questions like this is I don't want people I'm talking to you who's listening right now, you, yes, you, to take out a pencil and write this down and be like, okay, this is how it's done. This is how Jose has done it. And you're going to find the way that's comfortable for you. And you're going to experiment just like you do with your painting. And you're going to find the different ways of getting your work out and talking about your work and marketing your work in the way that's right for you. So I'm off my soapbox now. There's my preface. (laughs) Jose, here's your question. (laughs) What techniques, you know, if you want to call it marketing techniques, what techniques of getting your work out has worked the best for you? People reach. I know it sounds obvious, but it always has come down to that. I just couldn't recognize it. It's people reach. You have to reach audiences. One of the things that I did from the beginning that I didn't realize that I was doing was that I was reaching audiences. I would talk to interior designers. This is one of the things, right? Mm-hmm. I would talk to interior designers who had already an audience. People that not not necessarily that were starting out, but people who already had an audience. I would reach people that were doing that had nothing to do with maybe with art and were doing caterings or parties or this or that. And they had an audience already. Building an audience from scratch is one of the things that that a lot of people try to do today. And and it's very noble and fair. But riding the wave with someone else's audience is a much smarter game. And that's one of the things that I've learned and that I've realized that I've done over and over. My technique is look where the people are. Where are people hanging out? Mm -hmm. And go with your message. And one of the things that to add on to that... Well, this is how I've done it. Okay, I can't say don't don't do it because it might work for you. All of a sudden, you you hit the jackpot, and <laughs> and here I am saying don't do that. <laughs> I did exactly the opposite of what Jose said. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't lead with the work. You would not. No, I would not lead with my work. Everybody's doing that. This is counterintuitive. I would not lead with look at my work. I feel like everybody's doing that, and it gets lost. It's like it's another product in the shuffle. 
I would lead with service. This is one of the things that I've, that I've done over and over. What can I do for you? If I see that you have a gallery, for example, this is one of the things that I've done with, with galleries. I see that someone has a gallery and, and I'm interested in, in trying to show my work. Instead of saying, please pick me, please pick me. How about if you have, I don't know, 10,000 followers on, on Facebook and start talking about that. Start talking about, look, this is, this is one of the reasons not only my work is great and blah, 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 what everybody else says, but also I have 10,000 followers on Facebook or I have, I have a podcast or I have a YouTube channel where I get you know, a lot of views and people talk about me and whatnot. And maybe you are not monetizing yet, but you have a group of people that are following you somewhere. Maybe your church friends or this or that, I don't know, whatever audience it is, that will ring a bell to any gallery owner, any smart gallery owner and be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, let's talk about this because that way you're not necessarily just you're not pitching the same thing that everyone else is pitching you're pitching something that will benefit them primarily interesting well i think it's a different way of saying something that that i absolutely believe in which is understanding the gallery and understanding what that particular gallery needs and where their problems are and what solutions you can bring to it as opposed to Hi, I'm an artist, put my work up. You're building a relationship. And if you want to build a relationship with somebody, then you need to take the time to get to know them and to listen to them and to listen to what it is that they, that particular gallery is struggling with. And then think about, okay, how can I help you? It's basically, how can I help you help me? Absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't want to go and talk about some sort of value that they have no interest in. Right. It has to be a value that they're interested in somewhere where they may be lacking or somewhere where they may where they need help. Absolutely agree. It has to be some sort of service and sort of comes down to value. I think the, the, the exchange of value. I, this is one of the very first things that I started learning from marketers. A lot of the the I guess the the marketing business savvy aspect of being an artist. I did not learn it from any artist. I learned it from from other industries. And I remember listening to uh, this famous marketer. His name is Dan Kennedy. Mm-hmm. He, he's got all this, those books out there and whatnot. In those circles, I guess he's famous. He mentioned something very interesting. He said, you want to make sure that you go from being an unwanted pest to a welcome guest. And you have to figure out what that button is. And I agree absolutely with you. You have to find out what, what it is that, that they consider valuable so that you can approach honestly, right? You can, in, in, in with, with, with honesty, you don't want to of course. <laughs> right. There's something that. Right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think, you know, like there's there's some things that I think we kind of feel like go without saying, but I think it's always worth mentioning is like all of this is prefaced by doing good work, you know, putting your time in, putting those thousands of hours on the canvas, you know, and also being authentic and being you. I think the biggest resistance that I hear artists say they have about marketing is they feel like it's sleazy. They feel like it's, they have to be somebody else. And the truth is like, if you try to be somebody else, you're going to end up being sleazy and it's not going to work and it's just a waste of your time. So the thing that you want to do is actually the thing that you should do, which is authentically share your work, sell your work, and get it out there in a way that's true for you. And that's, there will be crossover and there will be similarities between you and other artists, but everybody's going to do it their own way. And some people are going to be really comfortable doing it this way and not so comfortable doing it another way. And there's nothing wrong with that. You find the way, you know, like you were sort of alluding to this, Jose, when you were saying that, you know, it's worth it to find the venue, whether that's a gallery, whether that's eBay, whether that's Etsy, whether that's Instagram or Facebook, and then really dive into that. So I don't think any one of those is is inherently better than the other one. It's the one that you enjoy using and you get behind and the way that it works fits your personality. And that's the one that you should sort of fixate on and learn and, and really pursue. And then you can expand from there. Absolutely. I would say, I would add on to that, to try them, try them all, try mm-hmm. as many as you can. Yeah. You start touching those buttons until, until something clicks because you want the audience to click with you. For example, one of the things that's working for me right now, it's Instagram stories. 
Mm -hmm. Not only it's 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 fairly new, people are using it, but but I find it, you know, every time I do a, a little painting demo, a little crowd gathers, you know, a little crowd, whether it's 50, 100 people, whatever that is. I'm not very proficient in Instagram yet, but but uh, <laughs> I found that that I click with them, they click with me, and I can see that more than likely growing into something really nice in, in the near future. Yeah, yeah. And everybody starts somewhere on everything. And I think we intellectually know that, but we sometimes forget it, that when you start any of these things that we've talked about, it's going to be awkward and weird. And you try it out and you see if it fits. And if it doesn't fit, then you try something else on and you set it aside. But you sort of have to go through that awkward teenager phase in, in anything that you do. So, you know, like that's a part of it. That's the piece that you have to push through and build up your confidence by having little tiny successes one right after the other. It's the domino effect. If anybody's on my email list, then you know what I'm talking about. But these little incremental changes that we make will eventually just knock down a whole roll of dominoes and get you to where you want to be. But it's these tiny little steps that we have to take first. And it's being awkward and uncomfortable and not quite sure of what you're doing until you eventually learn the skills that you need. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that it's worth mentioning is to create consistency and persistence. Mm. Once you start clicking with something, please do yourself a favor. Do not move from there. If people start clicking with you on YouTube, don't try something else right away. Like, it's watch it grow foster it, watch it grow. Like you, you, you want to make one of the things that I've realized that was more important for me. And I know that this doesn't fly well with a lot of artists when I say this, but one of the, the skills, if I would say the most important skill that I've learned wasn't to create artwork that came natural. Anyone can do that. It's a skill. The most difficult skill and the most important that I've developed is to have consistency is to be able to, to show up every day and say, I'm working on this again. Mm -hmm. and I'm chiseling this again. I don't like doing this video sometimes, you know, this YouTube videos or whatever I'm doing, but I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it again till it starts molding and starts giving fruit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's obvious, but many times because we've been taught that art, creating art is very much an emotional approach is, is another thing, the muse, you know, when the muse shows up, when I feel inspired and that, that's not going to cut it. And I don't think to go to the next level, whatever that is for you, whether it's creating a collection of art, going to galleries, monetizing, whatever it is, it's going to require a whole other side of you that needs to show up daily mm -hmm. or a set schedule. Yep. Yep. A lot of people resist that because they feel like a set schedule is somehow impinges on their creativity and... What I found, at least, I am very strict with my schedule. It's un <laughs> I, I'm sure it pisses some people off. But, you know, for example, I only do interviews on Mondays. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's to protect my own painting time. And there's, you know, like, I only do phone calls in the afternoon. And that's to protect my painting time and my other work. And being that strict on it gives me a lot of freedom and, a lo and the ability to focus and create when when I need to. If I don't have a schedule like that and I'm trying to do everything at the same time and I've got like 20 minutes to paint in between these three phone calls and a podcast interview and a promotion schedule and this and that, that doesn't give me the time to do the deep work that I need to. So being super, super strict like that on my schedule means that I've got four or five hours of block time where I am just in my mode and I'm, I'm in absolute heaven. And that's what you were just talking about, that consistency, that's how you get the consistency is being really strict everywhere else so that you have that freedom. Yeah. And to add a little bit to that, I don't think, I don't know if you agree with this entries or not, but I believe that the schedule thing, the whole uh, consistency, the whole persistence of it will not come without commitment. The, mm. the very first thing we need to do is commit. And I know it sounds kind of militant. It sounds, you know, it doesn't sound artsy. No, we don't, artists, you know, we're not known for, for liking rules. You have to, like, I'm sort of a convert <laughs> on that. I think that what we've been taught and what we talk about as artists, and I know I've been guilty so many times of this, is we're looking for ways to become creative. How can I be more creative? How can I have creativity? 
And really, I found, and I didn't, I didn't come up with a statement. I, I've learned it from a mentor. But it's really creativity follows commitment. And, you know, it's well expressed by, by Picasso. I, I want, yes, I believe in inspiration, but, it, you know, it has to find you working. Mm-hmm. And the commitment to, to show up, I think it's really the, if you want to learn something, I think it's really, it's really that, you know, like, I don't even think it's a learning thing. It's, it's not. It's, it's this thing, this desire, this obsession. How much are you willing to commit to that? Mm-hmm. And I think everything else follows. You know, you know what the next step is. If you're committed, you will know what the next step is. You will not. I mean, it's it's great to read to books, to listen to YouTube's, to this great podcast, and of course it is. But but without the commitment, it's just I don't know. It's just it's not going to it's not going to be effective. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I found that very true. Also, I mean, when I started this podcast, I did it whenever I could, and it was a disaster. That schedule was an absolute disaster. The minute that I got committed to it and I was going to make it work and make it, I don't know how to do Yeah, it was, I, there's no other word for it. Then I was just like, I think for a while I was just doing it with, because it was fun. And in my head, I would quit whenever it was not fun. And then at a certain point, I just got committed. And that's when I got very strict about how everything goes <laughs> and, and how they, you know, I got strict about a lot of things that are kind of behind the scenes. And once I did that, it became like a hundred times easier. I don't, I used to stress out so much about getting the podcast out every week. And now I almost, almost do it without thinking, you know, it's just, it's part of my routine. It's part of my schedule. I know exactly when things happen and I know how far out in advance I have to do everything. And I almost, and it's, it's, it's routine now. And that's how it needs to be so that when I get on these calls, like with you, I can be 100% focused on what we're talking about. Yeah. And when we're having these calls is when I get to be creative with it. Behind Everything behind the scenes is not glamorous. (laughs) (laughs) It's very routine and it's very almost mechanical, but that's the only way to get it done. Absolutely. And I think it's the same thing with painting and, uh, you know, like the, all the housework and the housekeeping and the things that we kick and scream and fight and don't like to do. Once you regulate that and make it a system and part of your routine, as opposed to this thing when you do, when you have time or when everything's crashing down, you suddenly decide now's the time I need to organize my business. It's so much easier if you just make it a routine. Yeah. I mean, and, and all sorts of, I mean, I feel like you, you can only move forward by measuring. I think that, and I'm not talking about like how much return I'm going to get on my investment of effort. But by measuring progress, you know, it makes us happy. It gives us more enthusiasm. Like, oh, yeah, I talked to five people, you Mm -hmm. know, about my artwork. I talked to two galleries. And you start measuring those things and they're wins. Yes. And it adds fuel to the commitment because it gives you it gives you reason to show up. Well, yesterday I I followed my, my schedule. These are two things that I do, and I don't know, it may help an artist or two out there. Mm-hmm. But the very first thing I do in the morning is I, I write my goals. Mm-hmm. And then I get my to-do list going. And the to-do list, I've, I write it the night before. But I, I get it going. It's, it's like, I call it the, the long term and the short term. What do I need to do today that will get me to the long term? Mm-hmm. And this has really helped me. It's totally not artistic, but it gives me the time to become artistic. It prepares the ground to actually be artistic. It's a great habit and something I do as well. So that's why I'm sitting here just kind of like trying not to laugh. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's a great idea, Jose. I think you should do that every single day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a game changer. Isn't it? It is. Yeah. It changes everything. It changes. I mean, it primes mood. It primes because you're you're thinking about your goals. And right before I go to sleep, I write my goals again. What are my my long-term goals? And it keeps me, even when I have a bad day, I go and I write them I, to remind myself again, okay, I know I'm having a bad day, but let me remind myself where I'm going. Uh huh. Let me redirect myself. Where am I going again? And this has nothing to do maybe with art, but in my, I, I'm sure that in yours also, uh, Antris, it's got everything. Yeah, I think it's part of life. So I think that I used to sort of compartmentalize things and say like, okay, I'm here's my art life and here's everything else life. And it would be really frustrating when my 
quote unquote other life interfered with my art life or vice versa. And it was just, I would say things like, oh, well, you know, I was on this really great role with my art and then life happened and then this happened. And the truth is life is happening every single day. So those goals and everything that you're just, that we just talked about, that's part of keeping yourself focused and giving yourself the clarity of knowing what your priorities are and what's important to you and how you get that done. I don't do the goal thing at night. <laughs> like you just said, that's a really good addition to it. At night, I'm just a wreck. So yeah, there's my I have zero brain cells working after about 830 or nine o'clock at night. <laughs> but another thing that I, I do with that in, in the morning, one of my habits is writing down three things that I'm grateful for and why I'm grateful for it. Oh, I love that. That is also a big game changer. And that keeps you really focused on, you know, it keeps the art integrated with your life. Yeah. That's a, at least what I've found with it, because there's so much to be grateful for. And sometimes I'm just grateful that I have a really nice hot cup of coffee in the morning. And that makes me so happy. And like that's, that's the thing I'm grateful for at that moment. But if you think about like everything that happened in the past 24 hours, it's kind of hard to stop at three once you get on a roll of doing that. And and if anyone's having a really hard time right now and some, going through like a really rough period, that's exactly when you need to do it. When you feel like there's nothing to be grateful for, that is exactly when you should be doing this. I was just helping my niece get into this habit because she's going through a really rough time right now. And, and it's like, once you get into the doing it every day. And even if it's just these silly little stupid things, like it doesn't have to be a big, massive thing that you're grateful for. It can just be that hot cup of coffee in the morning and it's it changes everything. Totally. Totally. Because it keeps you not only focused on what you want, like the, the goals, mm -hmm. keep focused on what you want, where you're going, but it, it, it also brings you back. It, it kind of grounds you to what you have already, where you're standing. And that's, I mean, an attitude of gratitude. Must I say anything about it? That hasn't been said already. <laughs> you know? I mean, without that, what else is there? You, know, you can't even move forward if you don't accept where you're at. Right, right. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, Jose, this has been a really great conversation. And I know I, I find it really funny when I'm talking to somebody and, and you're telling me your habits and I'm like, mm -hmm, yep, I do that too. That's amazing. Like, you know, there's not a, a lot of people who do it, I, even though it's something that really has a profound impact. Absolutely. So I want to close this out by asking you, we talked a lot about your habits, you know, that have really contributed to where you are. But one thing I'm re I'm really curious about is because we've been talking a lot about the business side, <laughs> right, and getting into all right. of our habits and routines and the and the real like technical systems part of it. But what are the things that keep you completely fascinated when you're in the studio or you're outside painting? What is the one thing, if you can articulate, like just one thing that really gets you excited and makes you go like, oh my god, I have to get outside and paint, or I have to get into my studio and paint. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I have taken an approach. I paint about anywhere between 12 and 14 hours a day, whether I'm painting or I'm creating something in my studio. What? Yeah. <laughs> so I may be drawing, I may be painting, but I'm working on some sort of art. And one of the approaches that I take is because I've created artwork so much all the time. I'm always, I'm always doing this. I've taken a very Zen approach to it. And the thing that makes me, like, fills me with enthusiasm is the, the practice of just observing, just observation. When I started learning that artists, especially, you know, like our big master painters or whatever from, from history, they were master observers. Like, they would just sit and watch something and, and kind of let the mind rest. That really, that really fuels me. Like mm. just uh, looking at clouds, you know, I mean, just I don't look, look at stuff and, like, and I'm like, I got to pay. I, I think I, I already kind of went through that phase. As most artists, we go through phases. I think that I kind of burned that face already where I'm like, I have to paint. I'm burn, you know, I have this burning desire. Now it's just such a part of my daily routine that I like to practice painting without thinking. And that to me is really rewarding. It's really, or just sitting and looking at something and not painting it, just looking at it and, and just absorbing it, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be, uh, I don't know, I know it sounds a bit hippie, but, 
<laughs> just just looking at something, anything, looking at a bird and looking how fast they move. Like this, they have this thing that they move so fast. I love looking at birds or just plants, you know, how the wind just kind of hits them a little bit and they do their thing. And I'm not thinking about colors or anything like that anymore. I used to think a lot about that. I'm not, I'm not saying that I've overcome that or, or whatever. I just, you know, I'm not in that phase right now. Mm-hmm. I just love absorbing, just looking at something and, and, and not thinking about it. Just, you know, just looking at it. Right. For whatever it is. I love that. Very cool. <laughs> I hope that made any sense. <laughs> it did. I think it reminds me of the, you know, when you're painting and you're trying not to name what you're painting and you're just looking at shapes and colors and just observing them. I think it's a, it is a, an extremely important part of the artist's life is to go through that, just looking and observing and watching without any judgment, just seeing what the impulse of your eye sees. Difficult to describe. I think you did it better than I did. <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> but yeah, you know, just absorbing. One of the things that I've learned is that as artists, we're sponges, mm-hmm. and we got to be mindful where we are, what we're doing, who we're hanging out with, what stuff we're watching on TV, what are we listening on the radio. As artists, I feel like our space, we need to whatever. I mean, I'm not talking about any sort of spiritual or religious practice, whatever. No, just just life in general. We got to stay focused on, or at least keep a bit vigilant on what our surroundings are. Because as artists, we don't just absorb through our eyes or our senses, but there, there's, 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 there's absolutely more happening that I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know for sure, but it feels that way. It feels like there's, there's so much we're, we're absorbing. Yeah, because we spend so much time observing and so we, and thinking and noticing that, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Jose, thank you so much for your time and for this conversation. It was a lot of fun and you gave a lot of really great information. Thank you so much. I'm so glad. I I hope that someone out there, I mean, that's one of the things that I always, I talk to my wife about it. I I, I wish someone would start spilling the beans on on (laughs) what it is to be an artist, (laughs) how it works for them and not just, you know, not just talk surface. Thank you so much to Jose Trujillo for sharing so much of what he's learned over the years, selling his artwork and learning about all the marketing tactics. That was a great conversation and I really appreciate his candor. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the podcast tab. You'll find show notes for this episode and you'll see examples of Jose's work there and you'll get links of how to connect with him, plus all of the resources that we talked about in this episode. I'd like to congratulate Julie Beck for taking first place in the Savvy Art Competition for her painting Red Hand, Green Thumb. Savvy Painter, Gamblin Artist Colors, and Trakel Art Supplies teamed up to do our first online competition. Julie will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize. And you'll get to hear all about it from Julie herself when I interview her for this podcast. I am so excited to talk with her. So look for that episode towards the end of the year. Also, congratulations goes out to Susie Kefting Kuhn for taking second place for her painting, I Have My Eye on You. And Randall David Tipton's Cascade Headspring went third place. Congratulations to both of you. And last but not least, honorable mention goes to Brian DiNicola, Christian Fagerlund, and Hannah Mogbull. Congratulations, everyone. And thank you to all who entered. And a huge, huge thank you to Judge Carol Marine for going through the hundreds of amazing entries. If you want to see the paintings that were accepted into the show, just go to the show notes for this episode. There'll be a link to the online gallery. One more thing I want to let you know, this year you can expect a lot more workshops from Savvy Painter. If you are an artist who struggles with getting painting time in or feels like you're always busy but never really moving forward with your art, then my workshops just might interest you. Past workshops include Mindset Mastery, a five-week online workshop to help you get past the roadblocks that keep you from painting. In it, we tackle the inner critic, fears of artists, and setting yourself up for a successful creative day. 
The workshop, how to develop a relationship with the right gallery, helped several artists find the right gallery and show their work. So if this is something that interests you, you can go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop and get on the email list. This is separate from the main list that tells you when a new episode comes out. This is just for the workshop. So you don't get quite as many emails, but when you do, there's always something really good happening. Sign up now and get a downloadable PDF with case studies that tell you exactly how three artists pushed through barriers that were getting in the way of their studio time. You can, for example, learn how Rhonda went from not wanting to call herself an artist to getting her very first solo show. Also, listen to an introverted artist describe how she built her confidence and then spoke in front of an audience of her peers. And you can discover the tools that Samantha used to take back her power after a decade of believing that she had no, I'm putting air quotes there, she had no talent. So again, go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop to reserve your place on the list. When you sign up, you get that downloadable case studies that I mentioned, but more importantly, you get exclusive invites to upcoming workshops. Most of the time when I launch a new program, it sells out before I ever announce it publicly. So reserve your spot now at SavvyPainter.com forward slash workshop. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter podcast. Thank you so much for listening. 